Good morning, everyone. So happy to have you here this morning, early, early in the morning. And uh, we're thankful for Pastor Myung Kwan, who has uh, agreed to come and share the word this morning to help us to understand what is our mission moving forward. Know that Jesus is resurrected and he's alive and in heaven interceding for us. And uh, we know that his coming is soon and sure. I want to welcome you here to the Milwaukee Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. You know, last evening we had a good time with uh, Pastor Zach Payne from the Wizen Network. And uh, he has, you know, he shared a little bit from Luke 24. And uh, we were blessed to hear that Jesus is alive. He's risen. The tomb is empty. You don't have to be searching there anymore. So today we want to just start with prayer. And uh, then I'll do a song or a theme song, if you please, Pastor Mion. And then we'll turn the time over to you for you to share with us and with our online audience today. All right, let's bow our heads as we pray. Father God, we thank you for blessing us with the privilege of uh, a, a Savior who is risen and who is alive. Today, as we reflect on that, may your Holy Spirit uh, bless our hearts to lead us into all truth. And so we pray that you will uh, lead the way today. Lead, Lord, and we'll follow, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Could you turn up nine? I forgot to turn up nine on the... Yes. Early morning technical difficulties. They were watching from a distance And they could not take their eyes from you You were bleeding They were weeping Faithful sisters They had followed you They could not understand They could not see They were mourning their loss as the sky turned black and the earth turned red at the foot of the cross he was standing near your mother they were so close they could hear him sighing all around them Angry voices pierced the darkness, and you were dying, but they would not leave. They lingered there, no matter the cost. They were staying, they were praying at the foot of the cross. Keep me near the cross, near the cross. May I never stray so far that I cannot see what flowed down from me at the foot of the cross. Now I'm standing in your presence. And I cannot take my eyes from you. You have risen. I'm forgiven, precious Savior. 
Oh, I worship you. No, I'm not looking back. I've heard your voice. I'm staying here. I made my choice. Now it's real. Now I need you at the foot of the cross. Keep me near the cross, near the cross. May I never stray so far that I cannot see what flowed down for me at the foot of the cross. Keep me near the cross, near the cross. May I never stray so far that I cannot see what flowed down for me at the foot of the cross. Good morning. Wow. It's 5.30 in the morning and we're like, I'm very excited to see each one of you here. Share the word of God together. My name is Pastor Myung. I come from the Waukesha Church in the Northwest Church. And uh, I'm just delighted to be here this morning. Let's turn to the book of Mark, chapter 16. This isn't my first time giving out this sermon, but I feel appropriate that I should share this word today, this morning. So let's go to the book of Mark, chapter 16, and we will start from verse 1. It says, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to a tomb when the sun had risen, and they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. You could just visualize the shock that these women must have had. It's Sunday morning. Their beloved master, Jesus, died two days ago. And they're coming on the third morning, or on the third day, the morning of the third day to, to bring spices. I mean, they must have loved their master very, very much. So they bring these spices to anoint him, only to find that the tomb was open. Think about the shock, okay? Verse 5, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter and that he is going before you in Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So here we have a good news. The women go and check out what's happening here. They see the empty tomb. And another surprise that was awaiting them is that there is this being giving them the good news. Let me read this one more time. It says, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. But the angel says, you know what? This Jesus who was crucified a couple of days ago, he is risen. Here is the good news. So what would you do when you hear the good news? Would you go and tell others? I think so. And that's what the angel says. Hey, you know what? Jesus is risen. You should go tell the disciples. So verse 8 tells us, So they went out quickly and went and told the uh, disciples. Is that what you read in your Bibles? No, that's not what it says. It says, They fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were what? They were afraid. Huh. 
Let's go to the next part. Here it says, verse 9. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive, had been seen by her, they all rejoiced. What? That's what my version says. I guess you have a different version, right? No, that's not what the Bible says. It says, they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her. They did not believe. So think about this. When the good news of Jesus that he has risen has been heard, what's happening here? The disciples do not believe. Well, let's go to the next part of the Bible. Verse 12. It says, after that, he appeared in another form of two of them as they walked and went into the country. And when they had, and they went and told it to the rest, but they believed and rejoiced with happiness. Is that what you see in your Bible again? No, that's not what the Bible says. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. So the question is, why did they not believe when they heard such a great news? I wonder if this, this is something that may happen to us in the Adventist church. We call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists. Because of the name Adventist in, in, our, in our church title, we, we proclaim that Jesus is coming very, very soon. And despite the good news, when this good news is told, become very numb to it. And say, is Jesus really coming soon? We have the tendency to, to start doubting and not believe, like the similar mistake that these disciples made. So the question we want to ask this morning is, why? Why did the disciples not believe when they heard the good news? Okay, so here we have these two, two uh, incidences. And we're going to look at both of them, see why the disciples not believe. Turn with me to the book of John. Let's go to verse chapter 20. John chapter 20. And we will look at um, verse 1. This is a same narrative from a different author's perspective. Here we have the book of John. The book of John is written by, as we know, John the Beloved. Excuse me. Verse 1. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now if you recall, when we just read from the book of Mark, it wasn't just Mary Magdalene that went up to the tomb, right? There was Salome and Mary. Um, there was the other Mary. And here we only have the uh, narrative where it only talks about Mary Magdalene. It, gets, it becomes a little bit more clear when you read um, one of the best commentaries of the Gospels, The Desire of Ages, written by our commentator, Ellen White. Uh, she writes that when these women had first come up to the tomb, they saw the open tomb and Mary Magdalene freaked out. Well, they all freaked out, but Mary Magdalene was more freaked out. So she, she turns back and goes back to fetch the disciples. So when it seems like when the angel had appeared to the women, Mary Magdalene was not present because she had returned back to get the other disciples to alarm them of what had happened. So here we only see Mary Magdalene, and it only makes sense because this is from John's personal experience because we'll find out that John was here in this narrative. And so from John's perspective, he does not, he's not aware of the other women. Remember what happened to him? They didn't do anything else, but she went, they went to, uh, they were afraid they went back home. And it was only Mary Magdalene that came to fetch the other two disciples. So from John's perspective, he's not aware of the other woman. He only knows Mary Magdalene that came to fetch them, okay? So let's keep reading. Um, verse 2, then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple. And this other disciple is no other than John himself, the author of this book. And said to them, whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out, and, all, and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So verse 4 says, So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. The question is, hey, why did the other uh, disciple outrun Peter? Huh? What? 
Well, that could be a good answer, but simply because he was the youngest of the disciples. He was faster than the other people. That's how he outran him, right? But here, when you look at the following verse, it really shows um, the personality, the character of the disciples, okay? So verse 4, let me read that again. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter because John is younger. And they came to the, he came to the tomb first. And he, John, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, and yet did not go in. So if you can Im- imagine with me, we here we have two disciples running towards the tomb of Jesus. John being the younger one came first, right? So he comes to the entrance of tomb, but instead of going in to check out what has happened, he stops at the entrance. He's kind of hesitant. He's kind of a bit scared to see what's going to happen. And here we could really see their characters, right? But then this is what happens next. Verse 6, then Simon Peter came. Imagine Simon Peter being a lot older than John, panting because he needs to catch up. And finally, when he arrives at the entrance of the tomb, what happens? Following him, went into the tomb. It really shows the character of Peter, right? He's stubborn and he is very impatient. He has to find out what happened. So he goes in and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then finally, the other disciple who's been skeptic, who's been kind of unsure, who's been a bit scared to go in, seeing that his friend Peter went in, the Bible says, went in also, and he saw and believed. When this verse says he saw and believed, he didn't believe that Jesus was risen. He saw and believed in Mary Magdalene and saying that the tomb was empty. The body of Jesus was simply not there, right? Now, verse 9 is a key scripture here, okay? This is what it says. For as yet, excuse me, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Let me read that one more time. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. I think that's a very, very scary scripture. It says they did not know the scripture. Does that make sense? This is, we're talking about Peter and John. The, the three disciples, well, two of the three disciples that Jesus had already, always had taken them to. He would always call them, you know, when they always move around together with the 12 disciples, when there are special occasions, Jesus would call out the three just to be with Jesus. Here we have John the beloved and Peter. And the Bible says, for they did not know the scripture. It doesn't make sense. They were with Jesus for three and a half years of ministry. They were at the feet of Jesus as Jesus would present the truth. The disciples were there with the firsthand experience to listen to what Jesus has to say. And the scripture says, for they did not know the scripture. It's not fair because they were present when Jesus would prophesy about himself that he will be crucified and that he'll be raised again on the third day. They must have heard Jesus saying these, but yet when they witnessed the empty tomb, John makes a personal testimony of himself. And he says, for they, to be more correct, in John's perspective, he's saying, For I did not know the scriptures. So let me ask you this question. Do you know the scriptures? In other words, do you study the scriptures on a regular basis to be aware of yourself, to be aware of the things happening around us? At one point, you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and that's why you became a Christian, a Christ follower, a Seventh-day Adventist. But do you study the Bible on a regular basis to remind yourself of who you are and why you are part of this movement? You see, John and Peter 
they were the most devout followers of Jesus, but when they actually saw what happened on this morning that the tomb was empty, the testimony that John made was, for I did not know the scriptures. The reason the disciples did not believe when they were told by Mary Magdalene about the empty tomb that he was risen is because they did not study the scriptures enough. We need to keep reminding ourselves of who we are by studying the scriptures. We need to keep reminding ourselves of what Jesus will do for us by studying the scriptures. We need to see when the things are happening around us through the media, that things that we see, we need to understand, hey, this is the end of time. The time of Jesus' second coming is very, very near. But if you do not study the scriptures, we forget to prepare ourselves for the second coming of Jesus. You know, um, our church, the Waukesha Church right now is having an evangelism with um, our conference evangelist, Pastor Tom Michalski. We're having a great time. We're coming towards the end of the seminar. We'll be ending the series uh, next weekend. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see the new people come in. And we have had some consistent number of new people that's been coming out throughout all these evenings. And there's actually a few number of new people that has not missed a single night. I mean, that's really exciting to see that. But also at the same time, I'm excited to see my church members coming in because there were actually a couple of times when these members came to me, my church members came to me and said, Pastor Myung, wow, I'm really enjoying this. There's actually a, things, there are actually a few things I've never heard before. I'm thinking to myself, oh, that's great. But you know what? I'm pretty sure you've heard of this before, but it's, it's been a while since you've heard this before. In other words, we, 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 because of the routine and, and the repetition that we have in church by just coming to church on a regular basis, but we forget to study the scriptures, we, we, things just start to kind of fade away. And therefore, it's very important to remind ourselves to keep studying the scriptures to see what's happening around us. That's the mistake that disciples made. They, remember, they, they must have heard what Jesus had said, but they forgot what Jesus said. Why? Because they did not know the scriptures. So, for instance, you know, when we have, are having this evangelism, you know, when, let's say, for first night, you know, we talk about Daniel chapter 2. There are times when, when the preacher will ask out a question about, hey, what kingdom is this? What kingdom is that? And we, our brains freeze because we've heard of it at one point, but then because we haven't repeatedly studying it, we kind of forget. And when something happens, you completely freeze out and don't know what to do. Why? Because we do not study the scriptures. I think that's a scary thing. We have to come to the Bible on a daily basis to, to keep studying the word of God and teach ourselves, especially at the end times. Because the things that are happening around us, it keeps telling us, go back to scriptures and they will give you a clear explanation why these things are happening. And you know what? Jesus is coming very, very soon. That's why we need to keep studying the scriptures. And if you do not study the scriptures on a regular basis, this is what's going to happen. Let's go back to scriptures. Verse 9, let me repeat verse 9 again. It says, For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. And then the disciples went away to tell the other disciples. It's not what the Bible says. It says, Then the disciples went again away to their own home. If you don't study the scriptures, you're going to go home. Not the heavenly home. To your temporary home and do nothing about it. When you see things happening around us, oh, okay, it's a scary world now. But what about it? You will go home. Not the heavenly one. And that's what happened to the disciples. We need to study the scriptures. When you study the scriptures, it will wake you up. It will teach us and remind us of the things happening around us. I'm hearing rumors that Pastor Sheldon is considering an evangelism with Pastor Tom. If that's true, if that's true, I urge this church to be a part of that, to be supportive of that. Because when Pastor Tom comes in as a conference evangelist to do evangelism, it's going to bring a salvation. Oh, it's going to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to this community, but it will also be a good way for our church members of this congregation to study the scriptures once again. 
It's my appeal to you, and this is my way of supporting Pastor Sheldon. If he is considering it, and when he brings it to the church board, and we have our head elder here, please support it because it will bring a great benefit, not just to the community, but to yourselves as church members as well. Well, studying the scriptures is very important. Let's go to the book of uh, Luke, chapter 24. Here we have another set of disciples that did not believe again, and we'll see why that has happened. Luke, chapter 24, we'll look at verse 13. Now behold, two of them, were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they had enough time. These two disciples, you know, very famous disciples. Disciples, they're on the road to Emmaus, seven miles. Um, if you walk on foot, I don't know how long that would took, uh, take. Um, I like to run. And uh, for me to run seven miles, it would take about 10 minutes per mile, 70, 70 minutes, hour and 10 minutes. If you walk on foot, I would say that would take about two hours, two hours and a half, perhaps. So these disciples, these two disciples had plenty of time to discuss whatever they were talking about. Verse 14, and they talked together of all these things which had happened. What happened? That Jesus died two days ago. And they just couldn't grasp what they heard or what they witnessed. They couldn't grasp the fact that their beloved master died on the cross just like that. They thought Jesus, their master, was going to probably, perhaps, bring them out of the oppression of the Roman bondage. And he's dead. Just perplexed their hearts. Verse 15. So it was. While they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. You know what they were doing? They were conversing about what happened. They were retelling the story of what happened two days ago. But they also tried to reason. A lot of times when we study the Bible, we like to, to reason. Does this make sense? Does this not make sense? And you know, the, the faith factor must kick in. Because a lot of times when you try to reason the Bible, a lot of times it doesn't make sense. I mean, how, how can you reason about Jesus raising the dead back to life, right? The, the, can you reason that? You can't reason it. When you try to, to reason how God created the world in, in seven days, including the Sabbath, can you reason that? You can't reason it. The Bible tells us that we must believe what God has told us through the scriptures, and yet... When you reason with it, you, when you, you also had to have the, the faith factor kick in as well. So I'm not saying you can't reason when you study the Bible. You must reason because the Bible also makes, it, it, it's harmonious. It's consistent from the, uh, the front page to the last page. It's consistent with the message giving. So when you reason with it, it makes complete sense. But when you try to reason with, with a secular mindset, you can't reason it. It doesn't make sense. Therefore, when you study the scriptures, you must reason, but also with the faith factor into it as well. I'm going to tell you why that's so important, okay? So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Here, Jesus, I think I, he may be playing a joke on these disciples, but he intentionally does not reveal himself of who he is to the disciples. Jesus comes in and starts conversing with them. He said to them, verse 17, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? And then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, bluntly, what things? He's acting as if he does not know anything, right? And they said to, said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and work before God and all the people. And the, these two disciples, these two men, talk about what happened uh, two days ago about their master, Jesus. Verse 25, and he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ have 
to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures of things concerning himself. You know what Jesus is doing here? Jesus is doing a a one-on-one -on -one Bible study with these two disciples. I think that's kind of cool. I mean, if I was a church member, I would prefer having a Bible study with a pastor of the church because you think that pastor knows the Bible the most. In most cases, we don't know the Bible the best. But it's Jesus. It must have been such a privilege for these two disciples to have a, a personal one-on-one -on -one Bible study with Jesus. And this was what Jesus was talking about. Let's go back to scriptures, verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus expounded to these disciples and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So when Jesus is expounding the scriptures to these disciples, he's, he's started giving the Bible study based on himself centered on himself in other words jesus becomes the main focus of the bible study as jesus is expounding the scriptures to them so in the previous incident where i talked about john john the beloved and peter i emphasized that we must study the scriptures to believe but in this story in the second story we must understand we must study the scriptures but when we study the scriptures we must have Jesus at the center of the study at all times, no matter what. You see, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they conversed and reasoned, but when you reason the, the Bible without Jesus into it, none of it will make sense. So whenever we, whenever we have Bible studies, when we have, whenever we give out sermons, or when we do these prophecy seminars, Who must we talk about? Jesus. Jesus must be the center of any topic. When we converse about the scriptures, when we reason the scriptures, Jesus must be in it. Because when you don't talk about Jesus, reasoning will not make sense at all. You know, we do make these mistakes a lot of times when we're on the pulpit and preaching the gospel. We say we preach the gospel. We don't preach about gospel because we don't talk about Jesus. A lot of times, for instance, when we talk about Daniel chapter 2, you know, we know the prophecy from top to bottom. It's a very fancy dream that the king had. And so we, we spend a lot of time explaining what each of the metal represent. And then we, because we spent so much time talking about the metal, we have just so, much, so little time talking about the rock. You know, we have that tendency to make those mistakes because we like to, to bring in information, but we forget to talk about Jesus. And that's why as believers, when we say we're believers, what must we do? We've got to study the scriptures. But when we study the scriptures, we must learn to see where is Jesus in the story. We have to have that, that deliberate action, that desire to see Jesus when we study the scriptures. You know, when we have Bible debates or Bible studies with people from different denominations, there's no way they could beat us in Bible studies. We present the scriptures, and we're about, oh, this is the state of the dead, or this is the Sabbath message. But then we forget to tell them about the love of Jesus because we're just so into trying to beat them with their debates. And, and that is the common make mistake. We try to reason the Bible without Jesus in it. And therefore, when the disciples on the road to Emmaus, when they heard about the, the risen Jesus, they did not believe. Because to their reasoning, without Jesus in the center of that story, it just didn't make sense. How can, how can Jesus be risen again? It just didn't make sense. And Jesus had personally come to these disciples who were in despair to remind them, hey, this is why I died. This, don't you understand? I had to come to die. And so that's what Jesus expounded about himself in the scriptures. Verse 28, then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, abide with us. They're like, oh, man, this man, I'm learning so much from this guy. It makes so much sense that Jesus had to die two days ago. You know what? We must invite him to our house. We must dine with him. So they invite Jesus, still not knowing who Jesus is. Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Verse 31. 
And then their eyes were finally opened, and they realized that this was none other than Jesus himself. And that very moment, he vanished from their sight. Remember, from the two stories that we just shared together, I told you that we need to do two two. Do two things, right? Number one, we must study the scriptures on a regular basis as Christians. But when we study the scriptures, what must we do? We must learn to see Jesus in it. But when, you, when we do these things, two things faithfully, this is what's going to happen, okay? They said to one another, verse 32, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So when you do two things, that I told you, that we study the scriptures, and when we study the scriptures that we see Christ in it, this will happen. Your hearts will burn with fire. And then, when your hearts will burn with fire, the following thing will happen, okay? This is what's going to happen next. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen. So let me lay out the sequence together, okay? Number one, study the scriptures. Number two, try to find Jesus in, in, in studying the scriptures. When you do these two things, the next two things will happen. What? Your hearts will burn with fire. And because your hearts are on fire, what are you going to do? You are going to witness. Isn't that what Jesus told us to do? To proclaim the good news of Jesus? To proclaim the gospel? The reason we neglect to do these things is, number one, we don't study the scriptures anymore. We're okay with coming to church once a week. We, we're content with that. If you study the scriptures, there must be a, a, a sequence leading to one after another. Study the scriptures, try to see Jesus in it, your hearts will burn on fire, and you can't help but go tell others about the good news of Jesus. And perhaps that's, that's the reason we are not filling our, our pews these days around the Adventist church today. We, we proclaim, we claim that we have the truth, that we, have, uh, we are the, the remnants. But what, what if the reason for not being able to fulfill, uh, fill our pews today around the churches is because we don't study the scriptures enough? Because it's very clear when you hear about the good news of Jesus, you, your hearts must be on fire. And you can't just contain it to yourself. You're so on fire, so hot, that you have to tell others about the good news of Jesus. And that's what they did. Remember the disciples? They were hungry, remember? They walked seven miles. They sat down to eat, and then they realized it was Jesus. I don't think they said, you know what? I'm going to tell the disciples, let me finish my food first. I don't think that happened. They were so on fire that they put everything down. They walked and ran all the way back. They couldn't hold it. Seven miles back to Jerusalem. Verse 35, and they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. The story does not end here. There's actually one more thing I would like to share with you. When you go back to Mark, um, well, actually, let's actually read that together. Mark, let's go back to Mark chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse 14. Mark chapter 16, verse 14. Later, he appeared to the eleven. They sat at the table. So Jesus finally comes to the disciples who did not believe all the time, the whole time. It says he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. Jesus rebuked the disciples. You know, as, as Christians, we... We have a tendency to just want to hear the things that we want to hear. We don't like to be rebuked. Jesus rebuked the disciples. And, and there will be times when the pastor will need to rebuke you on the pulpit. Don't take it personally. And when it's time for the pastor to rebuke you, not saying that the pastor represents Jesus. No, it's not that. The pastor has the duty to correct us when we do things not according to scriptures. Don't take it offensively. But that's not what I'm trying to say. Let's go to the book of John again. There's something more profound here. John 
chapter 20. Let's go back to John chapter 20, and this will probably be the last scripture uh, that we'll be reading from this morning. Verse 19, John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut before where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. These skeptic disciples would only believe when they saw Jesus in person. Verse 21, so Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father sent me, I also send you. Verse 22, listen carefully, guys. It says, when he had said to this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. How awesome is that? Jesus says, Receive the Holy Spirit. That's what we need today. Jesus says, Receive the Holy Spirit. In fact, when Jesus uh, was giving his last sermon and the last supper table, the, book, the whole book of John, like the half of the book of John, is, 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 a, is a message that he gives the disciples at the last supper table. And he repeatedly says, I, I need to go back to my father. When I do so, I'm going to send you a helper, the Holy Spirit. So, what do we need, guys? We need to study the scriptures, trying to see Jesus every study. But in order for that to happen, who do we need? We need the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit. But as he said this, this is what Jesus does. Let's go back to scriptures again. Verse 19. I'm sorry, verse 22. When he has said this, he what on them? He breathed on them. You know, this is, this is actually a very, very disgusting statement. Think about it. How, how would you feel when I, when, I come to, when I come to you and breathe in your face? Would you like that? Oh, come on, guys. You know how that I, I wouldn't want any stranger to breathe on my face. Oh, even if you brush your teeth, come on. No, I, I wouldn't want anyone to breathe on my face. The only person that I would like to have uh, to breathe on my face would be my two little baby girls. Oh, baby breath are good. Oh, man, they smell really good. But other than my baby girls, I wouldn't want anyone to breathe on my face. But you know what Jesus did? He breathed on them. Why do you think he breathed on them? When I read this, the first, the first thing that came into mind was the book of Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis. I said this would be last text, but I lied. Let's go to Genesis. This will be our last test, text. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a what? A living being. And, and, you know, this is like the greatest testimony of, of who God is. It's just like the... The, the ultimate form of how God loves us. Imagine this, you know. We have God, the master of the universe. And, and the Bible says, he formed man of the dust of the ground. So imagine this. In order for you to, to, to form man with the dust of the ground, what do you need to do? Huh? Well, no, what you need to gather dust, but what do you need to do? God, the master of universe, will have to come down to this earth. I mean, it's not like God just spoke in words, let the dust be gathered. I don't think God did that. I think he did more than that. God of the universe, the master of universe, humbly came down to this earth. And in order for you to, now imagine yourself, when you try to gather dust, what do you need to do with your body? Huh? Stoop. In order for you to stoop, what do you need to do? You need to kneel down. So imagine the master of the universe, he humbles himself by coming down to this earth. He would kneel down. He would humble himself. And what does he do? He gathers the dust and beautifully forms it. And that is not enough for God. He says, oh man, that's a beautiful uh, sculpture right there. But is it, is it alive? No, it's dead. There's no life in it. So God does further, right? He's not only knelt down on the ground, and of course, this is my imagination. The Bible does say how he did it, but I like to imagine this way. He knelt down, and not only does he kneel down to bring life into it, what does he do? He brings his face, God, the face of God, down to the very bottom of the earth. To what? To breathe into the nostrils of this dead sculpture. And when it was breathed into the sculpture made with dust, 
the Bible says it became a living being. And you know who did this again? The very God himself did this to the disciples who did not believe. He breathed on them the life of God and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I think that's amazing. That's an amazing statement, guys. So, one of the first things that Jesus did when he was resurrected was to rebuke the disciples. And it was needed. It was very much needed. When he rebuked the disciples, he did that with love. How do we know that? Because the Bible tells us he breathed on them. And I could only imagine this must be the life that God breathed of the disciples, receive the Holy Spirit. And so when they receive the breath of Jesus and they receive the Holy Spirit, we know what happened in the book of Acts. When you read Acts chapter 1 and 2, the disciples gathered together to pray. The Holy Spirit came down on them on the day of Pentecost. And the rest is history. They started the Adventist movement. And that legacy is passed down to us today. We have a very important legacy to carry on. But that cannot happen unless we as a church gather together to study the scriptures faithfully on a regular basis. And as we study the scriptures, we must see Jesus in every part of the study. And when these things happen, your hearts ought to be on fire. And when your heart's on fire, you cannot help but witness to others. And this will be boosted when you receive the Holy Spirit. And I pray that this will happen to this church as we plan to preach the good news of Jesus Christ in this community, in the Milwaukee community. And I pray that there will be an explosion of the gospel and these will pews and this church will be filled until the day Jesus comes again for the second time. Should we pray? Father, we thank you so much for our risen Jesus. And we thank you for Jesus who is mediating on our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary today. But we also thank you for the task that you have given to the Milwaukee Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. And that is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. But Father, in order for all that to happen, I urge, I appeal to this church that they will come together as a body of Christ so that they will faithfully study the scriptures. That we see Jesus Christ in our scriptures and that we will be on fire and with the help of the Holy Spirit that we will go out and proclaim the good news of Jesus, that he is coming very, very soon. So Jesus, help us, lead us, and guide us. We don't want to go back home like the disciples did. We want to go to our heavenly, eternal home. So Father, help us, lead us, and guide us. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.